dread familiar. A cool breeze stirred my hair at that moment, as the night wind began to come down from the hills, but it felt like a breath from another world. Francis Marion Crawford Thanks to everyone for listening. This is episode 11 of The Dread Familiar. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite platform, and please check out some of the other great shows. It's all horror content on legionpodcasts.com if you have a chance. I do have a bit of news, which is that I'm going to do two more episodes and then take a break for a while to prepare for season two. I'll be doing a renewed push for content, so if you'd like your story or your voice to be featured on the show, now is the time to send in submissions. Even if you submitted before and your work hasn't been selected yet, uh, please feel free to submit again now. It can be something new or even something you've sent in before. I do read every single one. After the break, I'll be coming back with new stories and hopefully some new voices. I haven't worked out quite yet how long the break will be before season two, but I'll either announce it in the next couple episodes or I might do a mini episode as development continues to keep you updated. So send your stuff to submissions at the dreadfamiliar.com. Tonight I'm reading the second half of The Upper Birth by Francis Marion Crawford. In the first half, we learn that our protagonist's bunkmate on a transatlantic voyage has thrown himself overboard suddenly in the night and is not the first person assigned to that bunk to have done so. Part 3 We played whist in the evening, and I went to bed late. I will confess now that I felt a disagreeable sensation when I entered my stateroom. I could not help thinking of the tall man I had seen on the previous night, who was now dead, drowned, tossing about in the long swell, two or three hundred miles astern. His face rose very distinctly before me as I undressed, and I even went so far as to draw back the curtains of the upper berth, as though to persuade myself that he was actually gone. I also bolted the door of the stateroom. Suddenly I became aware that the porthole was open and fastened back. This was more than I could stand. I hastily threw on my dressing gown and went in search of Robert, the steward of my passage. I was very angry, I remember, and when I found him I dragged him roughly to the door of 105 and pushed him towards the open porthole. What the deuce do you mean, you scoundrel, by leaving that port open every night? Don't you know that it is against regulations? Don't you know that if the ship healed and the water began to come in, ten men could not shut it? I will report you to the captain, you blackguard, for endangering this ship. I was exceedingly wroth. The man trembled and turned pale, and then began to shut the round glass plate with the heavy brass fittings. Why don't you answer me? I said, roughly. If you please, sir, faltered Robert. There's nobody on board as can keep this ear port shut all night. You can try it yourself, sir. I ain't a going to stop any longer on board of this vessel, sir. I ain't indeed. But if I was you, sir, I'd just clear out and go and sleep with the surgeon or something. I would. Look here, sir. Is that fastened what you may call securely or not, sir? Try it, sir. See if it will move a hinch. I tried the port and found it perfectly tight. Well, sir continued Robert, triumphantly. I wager my reputation as a A1 steward that in half an hour it'll be open again. Fastened back, too. That's the horrible thing. Fastened back. I examined the great screw and the looped nut that ran on it. If I find it open in the night, Robert, I will give you a sovereign. It is not possible. You may go. Sovereign, did you say, sir? Very good, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Pleasant repose, sir, and all manner uh, enchanting dreams, sir. 
Robert scuttled away, delighted at being released. Of course, I thought he was trying to account for his negligence by a silly story, intended to frighten me, and I disbelieved him. The consequence was that he got his sovereign, and I spent a very peculiarly unpleasant night. I went to bed, and five minutes after I had rolled myself up in my blankets, the inexorable Robert extinguished the light that had burned steadily behind the ground glass pane near the door. I lay quite still in the dark trying to go to sleep, but I soon found that impossible. It had been some satisfaction to be angry with the steward, and the diversion had banished that unpleasant sensation I had at first experienced when I thought of the drowned man who had been my chum. But I was no longer sleepy, and I lay awake for some time, occasionally glancing at the porthole, which I could just see from where I lay, and which, in the darkness, looked like a faintly luminous soup plate suspended in blackness. I believe I must have lain there for an hour, and as I remember, I was just dozing into sleep when I was roused by a draft of cold air and by distinctly feeling the spray of the sea blown upon my face. I started to my feet, and not having allowed in the dark for the motion of the ship, I was instantly thrown violently across the stateroom upon the couch which was placed beneath the porthole. I recovered myself immediately, however, and climbed upon my knees. The porthole was again wide open and fastened back. Now these things are facts. I was wide awake when I got up, and I should certainly have been waked by the fall had I still been dozing. Moreover, I bruised my elbows and knees badly, and the bruises were there on the following morning to testify to the fact, if I myself had doubted it. The porthole was wide open and fastened back, a thing so unaccountable that I remember very well feeling astonishment rather than fear when I discovered it. I at once closed the plate again and screwed down the loop nut with all my strength. It was very dark in the stateroom. I reflected that the port had certainly been opened within an hour after Robert had at first shut it in my presence, and I determined to watch it and see whether it would open again. Those brass fittings are very heavy and by no means easy to move. I could not believe that the clump had been turned by the shaking of the screw. I stood peering out through the thick glass at the alternate white and gray streaks of the sea that foamed beneath the ship's side. I must have remained there a quarter of an hour. Suddenly, as I stood, I distinctly heard something moving behind me in one of the berths, and a moment afterwards, just as I turned instinctively to look, though I could, of course, see nothing in the darkness, I heard a very faint groan. I sprang across the stateroom and tore the curtains of the upper berth aside, thrusting in my hands to discover if there were anyone there. There was someone. I remember that the sensation as I put my hands forward was as though I were plunging them into the air of a damp cellar, and from behind the curtain came a gust of wind that smelled horribly of stagnant seawater. I laid hold of something that had the shape of a man's arm but was smooth and wet and icy cold. But suddenly, as I pulled, the creature sprang violently forward against me, a clammy, oozy mass as it seemed to me heavy and wet, yet endowed with a supernatural strength. I reeled across the stateroom and in an instant the door opened and the thing rushed out. I had not had time to be frightened and quickly recovering myself, I sprang through the door and gave chase at the top of my speed, but I was too late. Ten yards before me I could see, I am sure I saw it a dark shadow moving in the dimly lighted passage, quickly as the shadow of a fast horse thrown before a dog cart by the lamp on a dark night. But in a moment it had disappeared, and I found myself holding on to the polished rail that ran along the bulkhead where the passage turned towards the companion. My hair stood on end, and the cold perspiration rolled down my face. 
I am not ashamed of it in the least. I was very badly frightened. Still, I doubted my senses and pulled myself together. It was absurd, I thought. The Welsh rare bit I had eaten had disagreed with me. I had been in a nightmare. I made my way back to my stateroom and entered it with an effort. The whole place smelled of stagnant seawater, as it had when I had waked on the previous evening. It required my utmost strength to go in and grope among my things for a box of wax lights. As I lighted a railway reading lantern, which I always carry in case I want to read after the lamps are out, I perceived that the porthole was again open, and a sort of creeping horror began to take possession of me, which I never felt before, nor wish to feel again. But I got a light, and proceeded to examine the upper berth, expecting to find it drenched with seawater. But I was disappointed. The bed had been slept in, and the smell of the sea was strong. But the bedding was dry as a bone. I fancied that Robert had not had the courage to make the bed after the accident of the previous night. It had all been a hideous dream. I drew the curtains back as far as I could and examined the place very carefully. It was perfectly dry, but the porthole was open again. With a sort of dull bewilderment of horror, I closed it and screwed it down, and thrusting my heavy stick through the brass loop, wrenched it with all my might till the thick metal began to bend under the pressure. Then I hooked my reading lantern into the red velvet at the head of the couch, and sat down to recover my senses if I could. I sat there all night, unable to think of rest, hardly able to think at all. But the porthole remained closed, and I did not believe it would now open again without the application of a considerable force. Morning dawned at last, and I dressed myself slowly, thinking over all that had happened in the night. It was a beautiful day, and I went on deck, glad to get out in the early, pure sunshine, and to smell the breeze from the blue water, so different from the noisome, stagnant odor from my stateroom. Instinctively, I turned aft toward the surgeon's cabin. There he stood, with a pipe in his mouth, taking his morning airing precisely as on the preceding day. Good morning, said he, quietly, but looking at me with evident curiosity. Doctor, you are right, said I. There is something wrong about that place. I thought you would change your mind, he answered rather triumphantly. You have had a bad night, eh? Shall I make you a pick-me-up? I have a capital recipe. No thanks, I cried. But I would like to tell you what happened. I then tried to explain as clearly as possible precisely what had occurred, not omitting to state that I had been scared, as I had never been scared in my whole life before. I dwelt particularly on the phenomenon of the porthole, which was a fact to which I could testify, even if the rest had been an illusion. I had closed it twice in the night, and the second time I had actually bent the brass in wrenching it with my stick. I believe I insisted a good deal on this point. You seem to think I am likely to doubt your story, said the doctor, smiling at the detailed account of the state of the porthole. I do not doubt it in the least. I renew my invitation to you. Bring your traps here and take half my cabin. Come and take half of mine for one night, I said. Help me get at the bottom of this thing. You will get at the bottom of something else if you try, answered the doctor. What? I asked. The bottom of the sea. I am going to leave the ship. It is not canny. Then you will not help me find out, not I, said the doctor, quickly. It is my business to keep my wits about me, not to go fiddling about with ghosts and things. Do you really believe it is a ghost? I inquired rather contemptuously. But as I spoke, I remembered very well the horrible sensation of the supernatural which had got possession of me during the night. The doctor turned sharply on me. 
Have you any reasonable explanation of these things to offer? He asked. No, you have not. Well, you say you will find an explanation. I say that you won't, sir, simply because there is not any. But my dear sir, I retorted, do you, a man of science, mean to tell me that such things cannot be explained? I do, he answered stoutly. And if they could, I would not be concerned in the explanation. I did not care to spend another night alone in the stateroom, and yet I was obstinately determined to to get at the root of the disturbances. I do not believe there are many men who would have slept there alone after passing two such nights, but I made up my mind to try it, if I could not get anyone to share a watch with me. The doctor was evidently not inclined for such an experiment. He said he was a surgeon, and that in case any accident occurred on board, he must always be in readiness. He could not afford to have his nerves unsettled. Perhaps he was quite right, but I am inclined to think that his precaution was prompted by his inclination. On inquiry, he informed me that there was no one on board who would be likely to join me in my investigations, and after a little more conversation, I left him. A little later, I met the captain and told him my story. I said that if no one would spend the night with me, I would ask leave to have the light burning all night and would try it alone. Look here said he. I will tell you what I will do. I will share your watch myself, and we will see what happens. It is my belief that we can find out between us. There may be some fellow skulking on board who steals a passage by frightening the passengers. It is just possible that there may be something queer in the carpentering of that berth. I suggested taking the ship's carpenter below and examining the place, But I was overjoyed at the captain's offer to spend the night with me. He accordingly sent for the workman and ordered him to do anything I required. We went below at once. I had all the bedding cleared out of the upper berth, and we examined the place thoroughly to see if there was a board loose anywhere, or a panel which could be opened or pushed aside. We tried the planks everywhere, tapped the flooring, unscrewed the fittings of the lower berth, and took it to pieces. In short, there was not a square inch of the stateroom, which was not searched and tested. Everything was in perfect order, and we put everything back in its place. As we were finishing our work, Robert came to the door and looked in. Well, sir, find anything, sir? He asked with a ghastly grin. You were right about the porthole, Robert, I said, and I gave him the promised sovereign. The carpenter did his work silently and skillfully following my directions. When he had done, he spoke. I'm a plain man, sir, he said. But it's my belief that you had better just turn out your things and let me run half a dozen four-inch screws through the door of this cabin. There's no good never came of this cabin yet, sir, and that's all about it. There's been four lives lost out of here on my own remembrance, and that in four trips. Better to give it up, sir. Better give it up. I will try it for one night more, I said. Better give it up, sir. Better give it up. It's a precious bad job, repeated the workman, putting his tools in his bag and leaving the cabin. But my spirits had risen considerably at the prospect of having the captain's company, and I made up my mind not to be prevented from going to the end of the strange business. I abstained from Welsh rare bits and grog that evening, and did not even join in the customary game of whist. I wanted to be quite sure of my nerves, and my vanity made me anxious to make a good figure in the captain's eyes. Part 4 The captain was one of those splendidly tough and cheerful specimens of seafaring humanity, whose combined courage, hardihood, and calmness in difficulty leads them naturally into high positions of trust. He was not the man to be led away by any idle tale, and the mere fact that he was willing to join me in the investigation was proof that he thought there was something seriously wrong, which could not be accounted for on ordinary theories, nor laughed down as a common superstition. To some extent, too, his reputation was at stake, as well as the reputation of the ship, 
It is no light thing to lose passengers overboard, and he knew it. About ten o'clock that evening, as I was smoking a last cigar, he came up to me and drew me aside from the beat of the other passengers who were patrolling the deck in the warm darkness. This is a serious matter, Mr. Brisbane, he said. We must make up our minds either way, to be disappointed or to have a pretty rough time of it. You see, I cannot afford to laugh at the affair, and I will ask you to sign your name to a statement of whatever occurs. If nothing happens tonight, we will try again tomorrow and next day. Are you ready? So we went below and entered the stateroom. As we went in, I could see Robert, the steward, who stood a little further down the passage, watching us with his usual grin, as though certain that something dreadful was about to happen. The captain closed the door behind us and bolted it. Supposing we put your portmanteau before the door, he suggested. One of us can sit on it. Nothing can get out then. Is the port screwed down? I found it as I had left it in the morning. Indeed, without using the lever as I had done, no one could have opened it. I drew back the curtains of the upper berth so that I could see well into it. By the captain's advice, I lighted my reading lantern and placed it so that it shone upon the white sheets above. He insisted upon sitting on the portmanteau, declaring that he wished to be able to swear that he had sat before the door. Then he requested me to search the stateroom thoroughly, an operation very soon accomplished as it consisted merely in looking beneath the lower berth and under the couch below the porthole. The spaces were quite empty. It is impossible for any human being to get in, I said, or for any human being to open the port. Very good, said the captain calmly. If we see anything now, it must be either imagination or something supernatural. I sat down on the edge of the lower berth. The first time it happened, said the captain, crossing his legs and leaning back against the door, was in March. The passenger who slept here in the upper berth turned out to have been a lunatic. At all events, he was known to have been a little touched, and he had taken his passage without the knowledge of his friends. He rushed out in the middle of the night and threw himself overboard before the officer who had the watch could stop him. We stopped and lowered a boat it was a quiet night, just before that heavy weather came on, but we could not find him. Of course, his suicide was afterwards accounted for on the ground of his insanity. I suppose that often happens, I remarked rather absently. Not often, no, said the captain. Never before in my experience, though I have heard it happening on board of other ships. Well, as I was saying, that occurred in March. On the very next trip, what are you looking at? He asked, stopping suddenly in his narration. I believe I gave no answer. My eyes were riveted upon the porthole. It seemed to me that the brass loop nut was beginning to turn very slowly upon the screw. So slowly, however, that I was not sure it moved at all. I watched it intently fixing its position in my mind and trying to ascertain whether it changed. Seeing where I was looking, the captain looked too. It moves, he exclaimed in a tone of conviction. No, no, it does not, he added after a minute. If it were the jarring of the screw, said I, it would have opened during the day but I found it this evening jammed tight as I left it this morning. I rose and tried the nut. It was certainly loosened, for by an effort, I could move it with my hands. The queer thing, said the captain, is that the second man who was lost is supposed to have got through that very port. We had a terrible time over it. It was in the middle of the night and the weather was very heavy, 
There was an alarm that one of the ports was open and the sea running in. I came below and found everything flooded, the water pouring in every time she rolled, and the whole port swinging from the top bolts, not to the porthole in the middle. Well, we managed to shut it, but the water did some damage. Ever since that, the place smells of seawater from time to time. We supposed the passenger had thrown himself out, though the Lord only knows how he did it. The steward kept telling me that he could not keep anything shut here. Upon my word, I can smell it now, cannot you? He inquired, sniffing the air suspiciously. Yes, distinctly, I said, and I shuddered as that same odor of stagnant seawater grew stronger in the cabin. Now, to smell like this, the place must be damp, I continued. And yet when I examined it with the carpenter this morning, everything was perfectly dry. It is most extraordinary. Hello! My reading lantern, which had been placed in the upper berth, was suddenly extinguished. There was still a good deal of light from the pane of ground glass near the door, behind which loomed the regulation lamp. The ship rolled heavily and the curtain of the upper berth swung far out into the stateroom and back again. I rose quickly from my seat on the edge of the bed, and the captain at the same moment started to his feet with a loud cry of surprise. I had turned with the intention of taking down the lantern to examine it, when I heard his exclamation, and immediately afterwards his call for help. I sprang towards him. He was wrestling with all his might with the brass loop of the port, it seemed to turn against his hands in spite of all his efforts. I caught up my cane, a heavy oak stick I always used to carry, and thrust it through the open ring and bore on it with all my strength. But the strong wood snapped suddenly and I fell upon the couch. When I rose again, the port was wide open and the captain was standing with his back against the door, pale to the lips. There is something in that berth, he cried in a strange voice, his eyes almost starting from his head. Hold the door while I look. It shall not escape us, whatever it is. But instead of taking his place, I sprang upon the lower bed and seized something which lay in the upper berth. It was something ghostly, horrible, beyond words, and it moved in my grip. It was like the body of a man long drowned, and yet it moved and had the strength of ten men living, but I gripped it with all my might, the slippery, oozy, horrible thing. The dead white eyes seemed to stare at me out of the dusk. The putrid odor of rank seawater was about it, and its shiny hair hung in foul, wet curls over its dead face. I wrestled with the dead thing. It thrust itself upon me and forced me back and nearly broke my arms. It wound its corpse's arms about my neck, the living death, and overpowered me so that I at last cried aloud and fell and left my hold. As I fell, the thing sprang across me and seemed to throw itself upon the captain. When I last saw him on his feet, his face was white and his lips set. It seemed to me that he struck a violent blow at the dead being, and then he too fell forward upon his face with an inarticulate cry of horror. The thing paused an instant, seeming to hover over his prostrate body, and I could have screamed again for very fright, but I had no voice left. The thing vanished suddenly, and it seemed to my disturbed senses that it made its exit through the open port. Though how that was possible, considering the smallness of the aperture, is more than anyone can tell. I lay a long time upon the floor, and the captain lay beside me. At last, I partially recovered my senses and moved, and I instantly knew that my arm was broken, the small bone of the left forearm near the wrist. I got upon my feet somehow, and with my remaining hand I tried to raise the captain. He groaned and moved, and at last came to himself. He was not hurt, but he seemed badly stunned. Well, do you want to hear any more? 
There is nothing more. That is the end of my story. The carpenter carried out his scheme of running half a dozen four-inch screws through the door of 105, and if you ever take a passage in the Kamchatka, you may ask for a berth in that stateroom. You will be told that it is engaged. Yes, it is engaged by that dead thing. I finished the trip in the surgeon's cabin. He doctored my broken arm and advised me not to fiddle about with ghosts and things anymore. The captain was very silent and never sailed again in that ship, though it is still running, and I will not sail in her either. It was a very disagreeable experience, and I was very badly frightened, which is a thing I do not like. That is all. That is how I saw a ghost. If it was a ghost. It was dead, anyhow. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's episode. And that you're managing to stay dry. Don't forget to send your stories and voice auditions to submissions at thedreadfamiliar.com. The Dread Familiar was created by Joel Hackett. Tonight's story was written by Francis Marion Crawford. Thanks for listening. Good night.